Then, fortunately, missed the Bataan Death March. But we'll let Dan tell us how he ended up from Bataan to Corregidor, where he continued fighting after, after the troops were surrendered in Bataan. Dan? When the, uh, the 17th Pursuit Squadron, which was my organization, occupied a section of Bataan, and had withheld several landings by Japanese invasion forces, even though we were totally untrained. One Texan who was put in charge of uh, my squadron before we went in the jungle for our first battle stated, we're going in there to do some gravel agitating. That was his Texas expression. And I don't like it any more than I'm sure you do. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. So, after resisting several landing parties by the Japs, including one night they threw 60 barge loads in at us, each one equipped with mortars that were pumping mortar shells in, into the jungle where we were waiting for them. And that was just one invasion. We finally had the opportunity to thank Filipinos who had come to our rescue, who were with the Philippine scouts. They were truly a magnificent group of soldiers, and they would say, we'll take care of Joe. Yeah. We're here. We'll take care of them. They, they saved a lot of Americans who were totally untrained because they were superbly trained, and they proved they uh, could whip the Japs, and it saved my life twice by having them uh, take over and say, don't worry, Joe, we're here, we'll take care of it. So anyway, we finally got to the bottom with food and medicine and too many dying and wounded badly so that uh, we were part of the surrender which was an order to surrender. And as uh, the film showed General King, he stated, you did not surrender, I surrendered you, if any of you get home alive. So, when we were finally ordered to surrender, we were lined up at the tip of that Mar Valley's uh, Batan Peninsula that you saw on the map that John presented. And uh, we were just waiting for the inevitable to be taken by them to an unknown fate. So frankly, uh, I had no interest in an unknown fate so, so I managed to slip away from this crowd of Americans who had chosen to obey the orders they were given to line up and destroy their rivals and wait for the Japanese to take them. So I thought, that's not for me. So I... I had been watching a freighter burning in the harbor of Barbados, which was that town you saw on the map. And it had been burning all day long. It had been set afire by Japanese bombs. And uh, I managed to hide in crevices of this huge breakwater, which curved out into the harbor of Barbados, which is shown on the map, the tip of the town. And when I 
what I managed to get there, it was, of course, uh, getting dark. And uh, the English, I think they were all English, but invited a few of us to uh, join them. And as I recall, we waited till dark because the Japs were strafing anyone that moved in the water. So that was a certain death facing you, either there or lining up on the road waiting to be taken. So instead of that, I recall getting into the crevices between these huge stones that made up the breakwater. And when darkness came, I got the water and swam and, and I would also hold on to the boat to rest as we went across the piece of water to the island of Corregidor, which by rumor was a mighty bastion of our power, which no one could capture. So we were going to be safe there, of course. And uh, after we, uh, there were, I would guess, less than a hundred of us who had chosen not to surrender and go to Corregidor by swimming. And we were welcomed when we reached the island by a sentry who said, you're now in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we didn't know what the Marine Corps was, <laughs> but it sounded better than the fate that was uh, definitely awaiting us. And uh, we were actually assigned, small numbers of us, to each Marine company that had the duty of defending the island of Corregidor. MacArthur had pulled them down from Shanghai, which was their regular post in peacetime. And they actually were pulled down to Corregidor to defend it from the Japanese attack. And uh, theoretically, I guess, protect the high-ranking American officers who didn't want to be taken prisoner either. So, when we got into, uh, were actually told we were now in the Marine Corps, that was good. We felt relieved. It sounded better than what we were facing. And uh, I had a company commander of my company of Marines, and he was one of the greatest fighters of uh, the American forces against the Japanese. When the uh, forces were surrendered by uh, General Wainwright, he was told by the Japanese, if you do not surrender, your men and the men on all the small islands that were fortified in Manila Bay, if you do not surrender, you will be killed, period. So he decided what the hell, it was all over anyway. So he did surrender and uh, this a Marine captain who was my commanding officer, was asked by, after we took the island back, and we took most of the Philippines back, he was asked if he would like to come back to the States. This is after the Japanese were thrown out of the Philippines. 
and sell war bonds for the war effort. He said, hell no, I don't want to sell bonds, I want to kill Japs. <laughs> His name was Schaffner, and you can pull him up on uh, Google, I guess. Shifty Schaffner, an ex, uh, ex uh, all American football player from Tennessee State, I believe. So, Dan, can you tell the audience? <laughs> the events that happened on the day Corregidor surrendered, what happened? The day Corregidor surrendered, I remember it well. As we uh, were told again that you are being surrendered, destroy your rifle, your sidearms, your 45 pistols, and go through the jungle on this trail that was above our position, and you will run into the Japanese, and they will take care of you. Well, that sounded delightful. <laughs> When I bumped into the first group of Japanese soldiers, they were the meanest looking bastards you've ever seen in your life. And they had fixed bayonets, and I said, oh, this is it. They're going to take care of me right away. But all they really wanted, which is a great thrill to me today to remember, I think Donald Trump would love it also. Their first question was, Pock up head, Elgin watch. Elgin. Oh. These were the two best, most favorite products in the world in the field of writing and keeping time. Mm -hmm. Elgin watches, Pock our pens. And they kept asking for those, and each one of us who came by them would have them strapped on their wrists all the way up to their elbow. First of all, we were prisoners now on Corregidor, which was between Batan and across the bay to Manila. It was the gateway to Manila Bay, and it was fortified back in 1898. You told that story in the Spanish-American War. So we were ordered into, well, first of all, we were kept on the island for approximately a month. And during that time, the ground in the area where we were kept was covered with human waste, quite a deep, utter filth. No food was issued, no clean water. There was a water pipe we discovered, it was a half inch roughly, and it was supposed to take care of roughly 12,000 Americans and all these Filipino civilians. So uh, you had a terrible mess of filth and lack of food and water. That was on Corregidor. When they finally decided to take us off the island, we were ordered out to small boats which pulled in as far as they could, and you had to climb aboard. And uh, <clears throat> the boats would bring us to a depth probably up to our chin. So we went over the side in water. This is right on the rocky shore of Corregidor, uh, of Manila, I should say. And uh, you were in the water up to your chin. You were weak from lack of food and water. And they would then line you up and there were countless thousands, if you can picture the scene, of Americans lined up at Bayonet Point, ready to be 
pushed the board of trucks, but we weren't ready for that. Let me get my sequence in the order here. First, we would uh, actually walk through the streets of Manila. You could call it a march. It wasn't a gentle stroll either. And they, we were being herded by Japanese officers on horseback with swords drawn. And of course, I won't go into gory details, but you can imagine what it was like. They were proving that the Japanese were the most superior race. That's why they were herding us by horseback with drawn swords and bayonets. And our line got longer and longer, and we were in the blazing sun, of course, again. And um, we finally got to that same point that was shown on your map, and uh, wound up in a different camp, though, another large camp. And, Cabana Tuan. Uh, Cabana Tuan. That, incidentally, was the location of the food which they had, <laughs> under the war plan, they were supposed to have brought to Corregidor six million tons of rice, I understood, total. It was so near and yet so far. Food we needed, food was there, but the Japanese captured it. But it wasn't that they were particularly smart. Some stupid idiots who were running the uh, food distribution for the American Army had allowed it to happen. It should never have been left there. It was at the railroad junction, this tremendous supply of rice. Because up to that point, it was in the plan to bring this food into but had to feed the Americans and all the civilians. So anyway, we marched through Manila to, be, to demonstrate how the white man's day was gone in the Philippines. The Japanese were now the superior race occupying the islands, and the Filipinos better obey everything they said to order them to do. Thank you, Dan, for your account. And thank you, Kelly. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce Kelly. Sitting next to Dan is his second wife, and she's been policing Dan for me. Thank you. <laughs>